Hi everyone and welcome again to the Global Migrant Festival uh, 2020. Uh, for the first time, we are having a digital festival. Um, and this means that we have guests um, from across the world who are able to join us uh, for this evening's program. So this is the first session that you're tuning into of the academic component of the Global Migrant Festival. And the theme for this evening's discussion is At the Border, the Effects of State Policy on Migrant Lives. Joining us this evening, uh, we have uh, four guests who will be bringing us three presentations. Um, our first guest is Prof Mishra from JNU, who will be speaking to us on dispossession and distress migration in India. And his presentation will be followed by Priscilla and Emma from the University of Texas, who will be talking to us about migrant protection protocols. And finally, we have Hema uh, from UCL, who is based here in Singapore, who will be speaking about the social determinants of health among migrant workers in Singapore. Unfortunately, because this is a pre-recorded session, we will not be able to take live questions from the floor, but we will have a discussion across the panelists um, when uh, the three presentations are done. So we hope that you will stay through and listen to the many interesting insights that they are about to bring us this evening. Uh, so first and foremost, I would like to invite Prof Mishra um, to give us an overview. Prof Mishra, please. Thank you. from Jawaharlal Nehru University. And I'll be speaking about internal migrants mostly and how exactly the state initiatives, state actions, as well as non-actions, save the lives and livelihoods of migrants. That's what will be the theme of my presentation today. And I'll be focusing on a particular part of India, of course. As most of us know that it, since 1991, India opted for uh, a series of reforms and which resulted in uh, a remarkable, robust uh, economic growth, process of economic growth. But along with this economic growth, the rural urban disparities, as well as the regional disparities that had been increasing. Most studies also report a rise in interpersonal income inequality across India. So it is hardly surprising that in, in, in response to such changes in the economy, people have started migrating more, particularly in search of work and employment. Workers' mobility has increased, but most of these increase has not led to employment of the migrant workers in decent, uh, secure jobs. Most of them have migrated to the urban informal economy. This, this, this growth process has, has been described as a growth without employment or jobless growth. Studies on internal migration in India point to the fact that these migration flows are highly diverse. These are segmented. So what it means is that it have, while migration has definitely improved the livelihoods, the employment opportunities, and in general, the, the, the living standards of a substantial section of migrants, it's not true for all migrants. There are some who have encountered uh, hyper precarity in, in, in many parts of India. And these vulnerable migrants are not, are not small. It's not a small section, it's a, it's a substantial section. Uh, and that is why the focus has been on the vulnerability of migrants. The, by that, I don't mean to say that migration as a process uh, it has, has, has a problem uh, overall. But what I want to say is that the average picture that migration studies portray may not be true of uh, true for everyone. And particularly a section of migrants who work as mobile workers, who work as, as in, in, the, in the work sites, live in the work sites, they remain as invisible citizens. During the pandemic, the migrants were in fact forgotten in the initial policy responses, but they made themselves visible because they could not sustain themselves during the period of lockdown. Indian government, imposed a very strict lockdown, which was announced almost abruptly. And it for the middle classes, it meant uh, staying inside their home, social distancing, so on and so forth. But for the workers, this sudden loss of income and employment was too much. And they started moving out. And because the, communi the, the communication networks had stopped, they started working home. These images would haunt uh, 
the, the, the conscience of the world as well as that of Indians for a long time to come. Initially, they were treated as deviants, as unruly mobs, as a law and order problem uh, at the destination as well as at the origins. But gradually, civil society initiatives as well as government initiatives started to recognize the, the, the fate of migrants, the problem of migrants. But this was not just something which was caused because of the, the suddenness of the pandemic, simply because the economy of the society was not prepared for this. This was a manifestation of a deeper problem. Who are these vulnerable migrant workers that I'm talking about? Most of them work in, 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 in the informal economy that is unrecognized, that is, that is not disorganized by the way, that is not, uh, that is not something which comes under the, the strict sense of the formal economy where jobs are secure. Uh, they work either as self-employed or as wage workers, but they are also employed as, 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 as informal workers, as casualized workers, contract workers in the formal economy. It is part of the process of informalization of the formal sector that I'm talking about. But within this, uh, this, this formal in, in informal economy continuum, we have a particular section of migrants on whom I would focus. And these are seasonal and circular migrants who are living in the urban areas. They are constantly, recurrently, they are, they are circulating between different destinations and origin areas. They typically migrate for short durations. And mostly these, these coincide with the, 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 the agricultural cycles. And, and some of them also mig migrate under uh, various forms of unfreedom. Uh, they are called bonded laborers. They work under tied loans. Studies show a stark difference in terms of the background as well as outcome of long-term migrants and seasonal migrants in India. When the long-term migrants on an average are better off than the seasonal migrants, the seasonal migrants are mostly from the less developed regions, from the depressed, uh, marginalized communi communities, and also from land poor households. I will talk about a particular uh, region of India, in Eastern India. This is a province called Orissa, Odisha in, 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 in its recent uh, official name. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, it has got a long coastline, very fertile lands, rich in mineral deposits. But yes, this, this state is also one of the poorest states in India. And within this state, I'm also focusing on a particular region called KBK region, which is the poorest region. So probably we are talking about one of the poorest regions in, 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 in Asia. And I'll be touching on three, three processes as, as the background to this process of out-migration or, or what I call distress migration, out-migration. One is the political economy of uneven development, which actually uh, induces people to migrate out from the less developed areas. Second is the historical context of disposition and marginalization. The basic argument being that what happens to people today is determined by the long historical process of marginalization and disposition. And finally, what the state does or, and doesn't do, that has got a significant bearing on the lives and livelihoods of migrants. Just to bring the context. If you look, look at the, the map of Odisha and the concentration of poverty in Odisha, we'll find that this, this region, which is in the circle, collect, this, there is a name, official name for this region as well, which has got a high concentration of poverty. And at the same time, if you look at the concentration of marginal, marginalized social groups, two social groups I'm particularly uh, talking about here, one is uh, the Dalits and Adivasis. Uh, of inofficial uh, uh, parlance, they are called scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. They have been given special protection under the Indian constitution. You see that the almost the, the maps are identical. In other words, the spatial concentration of the marginalized groups and the spatial concentration of poverty, that, that, that tells us something about the way these two are linked. If we look at the official data, this the, the, the spatial and the social concentration. That, that comes out very clearly. Poverty has been declining in Odisha. Odisha has been at the forefront of neoliberal uh, reforms since, uh, since uh, 2000. And we find that that poverty has dramatically reduced. But even as poverty is reducing, what we find is that uh, among this, the, the, the interior parts, that southern here, the, the KBK region, if you are a, a, a person belonging to scheduled tribe or, or an Adivasi, then the chances that you are poor goes up. For many years, I've been studying about the process of seasonal out-migration from this area. And very briefly, this, this, this is the picture, which is not very surprising. Unlike many other areas, they, 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 the out-migration is, is, is uh, mostly seasonal. That is, people migrate in the lean season, where they do not have any work in local agriculture. 
they mostly mig migrate to the neighboring states this is something which is not necessarily true in rest of india they they belong to land poor households agricultural laborer and and cultivators very small cultivators unskilled less educated people so mostly again from the marginalized socialist so social groups and the nature of work is mostly on skill particularly in the construction sector and they themselves say say that the the main reason is lack of employment in the uh, in the, the lean city if you look at the processes and outcomes even this uh, in even in this small region that i'm talking about india is very diverse and big but even if in this small region we find that not all migrants fit into the same category one particular group stand out that is family migrants migration to the brick making industries in the neighboring states almost always through labor contractors against tied loans the other group is male selective um, migration to the construction sector these are particularly young people they use the network of family and friends rather than the those of labor contractors and finally those who work from uh, the the rain fed agriculture to the irrigated agriculture we also see divergent outcomes the, the we can say conclusively that those who migrate through labor contractor there is a local term for that called dadan those who migrate particularly from eastern india through contractors to the construction and other sectors they are much less than other kinds of migrants even if they are on skill the other migrants are on skill and it is a response to poverty but at the same time our study shows that 88% a very high percentage of migrants are still poor and when we see what is the relationship between years of migration and poverty we see that even even after migrating for for years many years people do not necessarily come out of poverty and other data also shows that this is largely a subsistence driven a distress driven migration it is generally assumed that that modern economies are uh, capitalist economies are 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 economies where some of the extreme forms of one freedom will not be tolerated because there will be institutions there will be safeguards so on and so forth there are many elements particularly in terms of debt bondage the possibility the 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 uh, you know the uh, choice of of exiting a contract the choice of deciding where to go for for work the choice of leaving a work these are not there in 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 these in these migration contracts typically there is there is no scope for bargaining because you, your your labor contractor has already bargained and and you don't know what is the the, the wage rate that you are going to get i'll talk about borders at the end but also when we th think of borders we typically think of international borders what i am saying here is that when people migrate to even neighboring states within in the, in the same country because of lack of familiarity with with with, with local languages because of no not having access to state institutions in the, at the destination they feel they 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 find find themselves in a very difficult situations so it, it, this this enforces a, a disadvantage for the migrant workers particularly this kind of migrant workers and there have been numerous instances of violence or threat of violence if they do not uh, if they protest or they do not uh, follow the, the dictates of their employers now the point that i'm trying to say is that despite these evidences there is an there is a there is a there is an argument particularly powerful in contemporary india that uh, the 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 process of migration essentially is is a normal response of an of a developing economy so that's what happens when development happens people migrate from the backward areas to the more advanced areas it's an uneven and that's how the economy grows however what i'm trying to say is that why is it a particular group of uh, people who can be identified through their social identities they migrate year after year to the same kind of uh, uh, distressful migration uh, where uh, they do not have the minimum minimum citizenship right which is granted to other citizens of india it's hardly accidental in order to understand that my argument is that we need to go back to history a little bit we need to see how historically these regions developed these regions were not directly governed by the the, the colonial government these were uh, uh, indirectly governed through various uh, small states small small kings uh, principalities and these regions where where the dalits and adivasis were the were the indigenous communities this saw a lot of changes during the colonial period itself where for revenue generation all livelihood resources including land water forest were gradually privatized and the commodification of nature itself created processes of exclusion which finally led to a situation where 
they were deprived. So the, the, the process of disposition, which had its beginning in the colonial period, but which continued in the, in the, in the uh, post-independence period as well, is somehow linked to the contemporary forms of this uh, forms of distress that we are we, we are witnessing how it worked in the post uh, independence period this region attracted investment but this investment was for quote unquote national development so large amount of land was acquired for example for dam projects for for factories conservation projects so on and so forth but the but the, the but the institutional mechanism for providing compensation and alternative livelihoods was very weak in fact the same colonial law was used to, to displace people from their land. So what we have seen is, is definitely there has been some industrialization, some uh, dams were built, but with very little forward and backward linkages, we virtually created isolated pockets of prosperity within a, a very backward uh, uh, region. So that is why we find that, that people responded in very ways, in very many ways. Some of some, some people moved, moved to new locations, tried to create a new livelihoods. Some simply joined uh, as, as popularized wage labor or self-employed people in the urban informal sector. Post 1990s, a new set of uh, new uh, kind of you know arrangement has come up. That is now the land acquired to be acquired for corporate interest is being equated with national development, and hence, although there is a greater awareness of the ill effects of of, of disposition. Policy in practice is more aggressive in now pursuing a, 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 a process of mining and industrialization. Virtually, it has been agreed that the only way to attract capital is by giving concessions for mining and, and various kinds of mining based, mineral based industries. And hence, what you can do is you, the state's primary role is that of has become that of a land broker who should provide land at the cheapest possible price to, uh, to, to, to the uh, industries, corporate powers who want to come in. So we have seen a, a, a catastrophic rise in these forms of disposition, but these dispositions have been talked about to some extent at least, because it's, it's, its impact is for everyone to see. People lose their livelihoods, people have to move out, so on and so forth. I will draw your attention to another form of disposition, which I will call as disposition in slow motion. Here, the role of state is significant. By the way, in all forms of disposition, the role of state power is very significant. The coercive power of the state is very much there when uh, a land is being acquired. One should think those of us who, who believe in, in, the, in, the, in the efficiency of market system should pause and think what could be the market justification for such use of coercive power. That coercive power, at least you can see in a very explicit way in, in catastrophic disposition. But these kind of dispositions, which I call disposition in slow motion, they, they, appear, they, they, they happen in many ways, very many ways, but two I will uh, identify, one is through environmental degradation, the, simply the resources which are crucial for survival of the people are not available or restructuring of property rights. That means the resources might be there, but now property rights have been redefined in such a way that ordinary people, particularly the marginalized sections, do not have easy access to these, these kind of resources, the, the, these livelihood resources. So we see a set of factors like deforestation, soil degradation, loss of commons, uh, the decline in tank irrigation, you might think that these are disjoint processes. But what I'm trying to say is that if we want to understand how exactly people choose to go year after year, knowing very well that they, they do not have the rights of other workers in this sector, still they migrate, this is probably the answer. I'll just, I'm about to conclude, but this is how what, the, what are the, the, these are the ways through which state action and inaction perpetuate this process. The fact that the migrants about whom we discussed in this presentation have opted for, or they are, they are part of a process, a recurring process of uh, vulnerability, low wages, tied loans, means that they, they, they do not have enough choices. They do not have enough effective choices to exercise. So one way of looking at it is not just what the state does in the process of, in, 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 in the sphere of disposition, but in the normal process of governance, economic governance in particular, what is the uh, what is the role of the state in terms of following the rules, following the existing programs and provisions? Take for example the fact that the the lack of effective employment opportunities is rooted in rain-fed agriculture. The fact that rain-fed agriculture cannot provide enough employment during the lean season, which itself is a result of 
lack of institutional reforms and lack of productive investment in agriculture over a period of time subsidized food employment guarantee access to formal credit these are the nodes which can change the bargaining position of the workers the idea is not to discourage migration or stop migration the idea is to eliminate some of the worst forms of out migration which is linked to lack of food uh, indebtedness lack of employment so state action in these spheres also has got an impact on what the migrants can uh, decide or what the market what are the effective choices before the migrants lastly the question of uh, fragmented citizenship rights even within the same country when your rights are tied to particularly the economic rights are tied to your uh, domicile status that means it is effective only in the state or in the province in which you are uh, a legal citizen and it it has got very limited apl applicability at the places of destinations it becomes very difficult for the uh, migrants to exercise their citizenship rights particularly the migrants who work who move from one work site to another who move who constantly who are on the move they find that they are effective then they effectively become invisible citizens so one way of addressing the the role of state in the context of some of the worst forms of migration is by looking at the universalization of citizenship right so that the, the migrants have the same set of rights across the country irrespective of the kind of work, work that they are doing the 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 uh, state that where, where they are located and 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 the state of employment they are in so i'll stop here by by drawing your attention to the linkages between forms of dispossession state action and some of the worst forms of migration i will stop here thank you thanks very much prof mishra so thanks prof mishra for that presentation um and next on this evening's panel we have priscilla and emma from the university of texas who will be telling us about migrant protection protocol in the us um over to you please thank you i'm gonna go ahead and share um our slides here mm -hmm. and then priscilla will start us off sorry i was muted hi everyone i'm priscilla and i'm with emma israel and we're going to be presenting our research that we did in collaboration with our peers juani torres and jessica eller so uh, as mentioned, we are policy students at the LBJ School of Public Affairs here in Austin, and we completed this research as part of as part of our coursework. And we worked in collaboration with FM Cuatro Paso Libre, a migrant shelter based in Guadalajara, Mexico, and the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. We will be presenting on the Migrant Protection Protocols policy and its impact on asylum seekers in Mexico. The Migrant Protection Protocols, known as MPP or Remain in Mexico, was a result of a negotiation between Mexico and the United States. The agreement requires Central American asylum seekers to wait in Mexico while their U.S. cases are processed. Before MPP, asylum seekers were allowed to wait in the U.S. for the duration of their legal case. MPP therefore results in a large number of asylum seekers waiting in Mexican border cities for extended periods of time. There are some exemptions to the MPP program. The MPP guiding principles, which was the document laying out how the program would work, stated that MPP is not supposed to apply to unaccompanied children, Mexican citizens, asylum seekers in certain, quote, special circumstances, which is understood to be people with disabilities, pregnant women, and LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, and Asylum, uh, U.S. immigration officers have discretion over who they put in the program, who's subject to it. So these exemptions were not consistently applied across the border. MPP was slowly rolled out from west to east across the U.S. southern border beginning in late January 2019. It started in places where there was existing infrastructure to carry it out and was therefore the easiest to implement. You can see each of the cities here on this timeline where it began. And in these final two cities, MPP courts still don't exist. So after migrants are returned to Piedras Negras or Nogales, it's their responsibility to travel to a different port of entry for their hearing, often requiring them to travel between 180 and 340 kilometers to their court hearing. 
This graph shows the number of people returned under MPP each month since the program began. As you can see, the numbers increased each month as the program expanded into new cities through 2019. But you can also see that there was a sharp drop off in April 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic hit the US, which we'll touch on a bit more later. All of these MPP returnees have active cases in the US immigration court system. However, MPP has created difficulties in accessing the humanitarian relief that they seek. About 7% of asylum seekers in MPP have legal representation in their court cases, and less than 1% have been granted a form of relief. At about 69%, the majority of asylum seekers in MPP are from the Northern Triangle countries, or Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. In recent years, these have been top sending countries of migrants seeking asylum at the US southern border. And as of September 2020, the highest number of MPP returnees were Honduran, accounting for 34% of asylum seekers in the program. This was follow followed by Guatemalans, accounting for 23%, and Cubans, which were 15%. The MPP guiding, the guiding principles explicitly exempted various groups from the program, including Mexican citizens. However, the data shows that there are 95 Mexicans that have been returned to Mexico under MPP. And originally non-Spanish speaking asylum seekers were supposed to be exempt for MPP, but as of January 29th, 2020, MPP was expanded to include Brazilian asylum seekers, and there are now 425 Brazilian asylum seekers in MPP. And so far, over 67,000 asylum seekers have been returned to Mexico under MPP. We'll now transition into talking about some of the effects MPP has had in Mexico. In regards to violence, the Mexican border states are some of the most dangerous in the country. The US Department of State classifies Tamaulipas with a level four travel advisory and Chihuahua, Sonora and Nuevo Leon states with a level three travel advisory. So the level four travel advisory indicates that the government believes Americans should not travel to those regions, and level three indicates that Americans should reconsider travel. So these dangerous conditions also exist for asylum seekers in MPP and are even amplified in many cases um, because asylum seekers report being targeted for violence because of their status as asylum seekers in those cities. This map indicates um, reported incidents of violence against asylum seekers in MPP the data was compiled by researchers from Human Rights First, and the larger dots show more incidents of publicly reported cases of violence in those cities. MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, has reported that 80% of asylum seekers treated overall um, in, across the border had been victims of violence. And then as you can see, violence in Nuevo Laredo is particularly prevalent. Nuevo Laredo has a particular issue with kidnapping, often in hand in hand with extortion. For example, a father and son kidnapped at a bus station in Nuevo Laredo were held for ransom until the father's sister in the United States was able to pay ransom for their reliefs. And this type of story is very common. Um, MSF has reported that 75% of asylum seekers treated by them in Nuevo Laredo had been kidnapped. In addition to being targets of violence, asylum seekers have faced unstable and unsanitary living conditions in Mexico. All of the cities that have MPP have migrant shelters, though as you can see from the data, uh, their capacity does not meet the need. This re results in people sleeping on the streets or looking to rent rooms where they can. Matamoros has gotten a lot of attention in this respect where, ten where a tent encampment has developed at the International Bridge where asylum seekers are living in tents without access to proper sanitation, such as showers or even having enough bathrooms. And when COVID hit the US, most shelters closed their doors and stopped accepting new migrants, leaving asylum seekers even more vulnerable to the virus and violence due to uh, the housing insecurity that they faced. And in addition to unstable housing, many asylum seekers lack access to work. So many asylum seekers and MPP are not given humanitarian visas and are instead given a forma migratoria multiple or an FMM as pictured here on the right, which does not grant asylum seekers the ability to work. About 56 of 
people returned via MPP have been given temporary corps or clave única de registro de población. And what corps do is that they allow asylum seekers to obtain access to employment, health care, and even education. But because so many of them lack corps, they are unable to find work leg legally, leaving them in unable to provide for themselves. In addition to impacts on the asylum seekers themselves, the Mexican government has taken on some significant financial burden as a result of this U.S. program. For example, municipal governments, municipal governments have borne the brunt of that cost. Um, governments have converted municipal buildings into shelters. They've provided municipal personnel to clean public spaces and provide resources. And in some places, the cities have closed um, public streets to allow Mexican immigration officers to deliver resources to migrants staying there, causing disruptions to traffic and, and downtown as well. The federal government has also made some investments in support of the program, including constructing shelters in Ciudad Juarez and Tijuana. In Matamoros, where that tent encampment exists, the federal government built two metal pavilions and installed some portable toilets at the, at the camp. And the Instituto Nacional de Migración, which is the Mexican immigration agency, has been responsible for filling some needs at shelters, including um, hygiene products and other resources. To pivot to the COVID-19 pandemic and how things have changed, um, it has obviously impacted MPP as it has everything else. Um, two major policy changes on the U.S. side are worth highlighting in particular. First, the U.S. closed its borders to slow the spread of the virus. And as a result, anyone who attempts to enter the U.S. unlawfully is now not processed as they normally would be, but is instead simply driven back to the port of entry and taken back to Mexico without any sort of legal processing. This has meant that very few new people are put into, have been put into MPP in the last few months, as we saw on that graph at the beginning. Those who have been put into MPP during the pandemic appear to be from non-Central American nations, particularly Cuba, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Secondly, the U.S. immigration courts for MPP cases have closed indefinitely. So migrants' hearings are being rescheduled well into 2021, leaving migrants facing much longer um, time and instability living in Mexico. One of the major concerns in the spring was that MPP migrants would catch COVID-19 and that the virus would spread rapidly among the community. Um, there have been cases reported among MPP returnees in several cities, but luckily it hasn't been the worst case scenario that many um, humanitarian organizations feared. The Mexican government recognized that significant risk posed by the MPP returnees um, and the virus. And so in earlier in the spring, the government financed buses to carry migrants back to the southern Mexican border to facilitate their return to Central America. And reports indicate that the number of asylum seekers waiting at the border has decreased over the course of the pandemic, though exact numbers are unknown. Um, in addition to the Mexican government's efforts to return individuals to the South, some MPP returnees have attempted to cross the U.S. border undetected. Others have chosen to settle permanently in Mexico and still others may have returned home on their own. And because of the negative effects of MPP we found in our research, we have two policy recommendations related to the program. The primary recommendation is to end MPP. Due to the research collected on the human rights abuses and denial due process for asylum seekers, we believe that the best policy proposal is to end MPP as soon as possible. And it's important to know that at the time of recording, the outcome of the US presidential election is still unknown. But we'd like to note that should Vice President Biden win, um, he had said that he would end the program when in office. And should President Trump be reelected, it is assumed that the program will continue and resume, and resume to full force once the COVID numbers have been better controlled here. And in the meantime, Mexico should move to address some of the most immediate concerns of MPP. For example, Mexico should negotiate that the U.S. define in writing who it considers to be high risk, aka those who should be excluded from MPP, and hold them accountable to comply with their own standards. 
This takes away any officer discretion and makes it a mandatory practice all across the border. And with that being said, policies in the US and Mexico continue to affect the lives of Central American asylum seekers and migrants. Their effects evolve as different presidential administrations from both countries balance enforcement and humanitarian priorities and policies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks both. Um, and that was a very uh, insightful presentation, I think, uh, especially for our listeners here in Singapore who might not have heard um, that much prior to this about the um, asylum and uh, migration issues at the US's south border. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, food for thought um, and we will have time to discuss that later. Uh, but for now, uh, we will invite Hema, um, who, is, uh, who has just finished her master's at the UCL, um, to present uh, on the social determinants of health among male migrant workers in Singapore. Hema, please. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, so hi, I'm Hema, um, and I'll be sharing on the health of low-wage migrant workers in Singapore, and, and this is part of my dissertation in UCL under the Global Health and Development Program. So just a brief overview, uh, when, I, when I refer to low-wage migrant workers, I'm referring to migrant workers who are moving from um, usually low- and middle-income countries in the region into Singapore under the work permit. And the work permit is given to foreign workers who are moving in to work in specific sectors, so say construction or as foreign domestic workers. And there's a bit of a gendered element to this as well. So female migrant workers come into the country under the work permit for domestic helpers in Singapore. So as of 2019, there were about 999,000 work permit holders in Singapore. Um, from a health perspective, when we look at their health care, there is state policy on medical insurance and it's compulsory. And the care for of the well-being of our workers is actually under the employers. However, the review that I did uh, aims to showcase that there are many different factors that affect the health outcomes of our, of our workers. And COVID-19 has also kind of showcased this further. And I'll be using um, the social determinants of health framework to kind of focus on this. So the focus, the focus of social determinants of health is that it looks at non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. So this could be the immediate kind of environment in which then an individual finds themselves in. So where you are born in, what, where you work and grow. It could also re refer to um, social and economic policies and systems, so stru structural systems that are present in the environment as well. And the ethical gu guiding principle for the social determinants of health is reaching health equity where health equity is the absence of unfair and avoidable differences in the health status. So using this framework and this guiding principle, I kind of conducted a literature review to look at how the health of low-wage migrant workers are affected in Singapore and how we can improve their health outcomes. So figure one here shows a summary of all of the social determinants that were affecting the health and well-being of our male low-wage migrant workers in Singapore. I won't be going into like extreme detail into all of the social determinants, but just highlighting a few um, things from the figure itself. So there were three main kind of health issues that came up for male migrant workers, um, and that were physical fitness, mental health, and infectious diseases. And these were the most heavily researched health issues. Um, and surrounding them are all of the social determinants that affected these health issues. And um, sexual and reproductive health and chronic diseases were less research. And all of these diseases are then how migrant workers then seek help for health work, um, for their health issues are under the health seeking behaviors of migrant workers and health seeking behaviors are also then affected by all of these social determinants. And underlying all of this are migration and gender. And these are this two underlying determinants are what I'll be focusing on, especially because they're heavily impacted by state policy and the health outcomes of low-wage migrant workers are heavily impacted by these two underlying determinants. So migration is seen and accepted as one of the key health determinants because of the vulnerable states in which migrants find themselves throughout the journey of migration from the country of origin through transitionary phase into the destination phase for labor and then the transi transitionary phase back as well. Um, and in Singapore, when migrants move into the country, 
they find themselves very economically vulnerable. Before they even move across the borders into Singapore, they find themselves in debt because of large amounts of money that they pay to their agents in order to secure a job in the country itself. And when they do that, then um, they find themselves economically vulnerable. And when they do cross the border into Singapore itself, um, they are kind of impacted by the state policies that are present, especially the employment policy. So one key in way in which this is, has been highlighted throughout all of the literature is the ability of employers to kind of repatriate workers, for example, and that then leads them to job insecurity. So, um, and this then compounds on their economic vulnerability. And how does this impact health is that when they, found, when they find themselves economically vulnerable in Singapore itself, it affects whether they take action or seek recourse for their health. Um, it also affects and impacts how they view their health and uh, what meaning health has to them as well. And another key way in which migration affects um, their health outcomes is the state policies that are present and how they define health. So the non-holistic definition of health and policy narrows the idea of health for migrant workers. So what, and an example that I can share here is that in the research, what, one way in which this um, has come up is for female migrant workers, um, they have to go through a six months medical examination um, to check whether they're pregnant or they have contracted sexually transmitted diseases. And if they have, are found to have um, an, sexually transmitted diseases or are pregnant, they are repatriated immediately. What this state policy does then is that it reduces sexual and reproductive health simply to the sexual behaviors and experiences of the female migrant worker. Whereas, but whereas research has shown that female migrant workers experience health issues beyond that. Um, for example, the chronic stress that they constantly face during work, especially in the realm of the home, affects their menstrual cycles and then their reproductive health. But such issues do not arise because of the state policies that we have in place that look only at the economic productivity of the migrant worker. And this also then affects how they, are, they view their health and what, when we talk about reproductive health, whether they think that um, a health issue they are facing is an issue itself. Um, and another key way this has been highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, male migrant workers living in dormitories have been heavily affected by the infectious disease. And for many years, there have also been um, concerns about the, the overcrowded conditions in dormitories. Um, when, we, when state policies adopt a view of just the absence of disease and not the prevention of disease, it becomes, narrows the idea of health um, and leads to just minimum standards of a living space. Um, and when this then gives rise to substantially crowded conditions in dormitories um, and that led to the spread of COVID-19 as well. So these are two factors um, that I've kind of summarized that make migration um, a and cause migrant workers to be in a vulnerable state when they move um, in search of labor into Singapore. The other key way in which um, it, well, another key that determinant that affects health is gender. So gendered policies kind of influence the place of work and the type of health issues that migrant workers face. Going back to the COVID-19 example, male migrant workers were more directly impacted by the infectious disease because of their place of um, residence. Whereas female migrant workers, because they found themselves in the realm of the home, which is a closed space within Singaporean society, were less impacted by the disease itself. And another way in which um, gender affects health or health outcomes is the kind of research that goes into um, the health issues that the different genders face. So in male migrant workers, physical health and injury is heavily researched because of the kind of labor work they engage in. However, physical health and injuries are also present in female migrant workers, especially in the aging population in Singapore. A lot of female migrant workers are involved in elder care. So one example is moving an elderly person from one place to another um, actually gives rise to physical health risks if not done properly. However, these areas of physical health are not researched in um, female migrant workers because of the gendered notions that we have about work. So these were the two kind of key underlying determinants that ha uh, affected health outcomes of uh, low-wage migrant workers in Singapore. Um, so with that kind of brief overview, the, the paper tries to um, suggest that first we need to adopt a holistic definition of health. So the WHO kind of recommends that 
or the definition of health in the WHO is not just the absence of disease, but looking at health as a holistic uh, well-being. And so adopting a holistic definition of health then allows us to look at all of the different factors that affect the health outcomes of a worker. And in order to do that, we then need to move towards a rights-based approach to health and well-being of low-wage migrant workers. Having said this, I do recognize that this will then require us to kind of look into the deeper political and economic realities of the country itself. Um, but however, the paper argues that in order to move towards this rights-based approach, we need to kind of question whether caring for the well-being of migrant workers is actually a zero-sum game. There's always this deep rooted notion of us and them and that caring for the well-being of our migrant workers is always taking resources from us. Um, but with the pandemic at the background, that we can start questioning whether the well-being of our migrant workers is actually a zero-sum game or the well-being of their health is also part of our society because they live and work within our society. And the other key recommendation the paper talks about is bilateral ties and memorandums of understanding. When migrant workers move from one country to another, the both um, it's in the both the receiving and sending countries priority to kind of look at the well-being of migrant workers, especially in this region, um, there are large amounts of remittances going back um, from the sending country. Um, and, it, and if the health and well-being of our migrant workers are not taken care of, then development and um, economic growth is going to be affected as well. And one key way in doing that is to work with the countries together. And also looking at case studies within the region to see how we can um, look at other countries to help uh, to move towards this holistic definition of health. Um, and one way that I would like to share about is um, how the South Korean government has been trying to work to with government to government to kind of um, create a system where the middlemen or agents are, are, are not involved in employment. And when you remove the middlemen, what happens is that the economic vulnerability that migrants face is reduced. And because of that, they're more able to say, I would want to seek recourse for my health um, and their health be seeking behaviors increases as well, which then leads to increasing health outcomes. So that's another key way in which um, we can work towards moving towards a holistic definition and right space approach. And it's an area to explore as well. Um, yeah, so that's really just a really short um, introduction to social determinants of health and how the different factors affect the health outcomes of low-wage migrant workers. And the paper argues that we need this holistic approach to look at the health outcomes in order to help um, development in the region and also to take care of the well-being of our workers. Great. Uh, thanks, Hema. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so thank you to everyone who has presented this evening. Um, and now we will have a brief time of Q&A. Um, I think we have about uh, 10 minutes um, for our Q&A. Um, and uh, well, as the moderator for this evening, I will um, take uh, the opportunity to start us off uh, with a quick observation. Um, I think um, between the three presentations, the, the one thing that jumped out at me setting the different contexts apart was the issue of territoriality. Um, so in Emma and Priscilla's presentation, um, the impacts of the migrant protection protocol are most uh, sharply felt by the migrants who themselves are not on US territory during the, um, at, at the time that they are under the MPP or, or waiting for their assessments, right? Um, whereas uh, comparing that to Hamer's presentation, for example, um, of course, uh, the low wage migrants are in Singapore um, itself although you did reflect towards the end about the how bilateral discussions can affect um, the recruitment processes as well as home country uh, situations that many migrants face before coming to Singapore. I think the, the bulk of the conditions that you were dealing with are determinants in Singapore itself. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to ask actually all, um, all three, um, panel, uh, well, all of the, the panelists this evening, um, to reflect a little bit on um, how much state actions are constrained uh, by the issue of territoriality. This question is especially for Emma and Priscilla. Um, do you think it's, uh, it's difficult for the US in this case um, to improve conditions uh, in, in an extraterritorial site, um, assuming that the MPP itself doesn't go away as per your recommendations? 
Um, and as for Prof. Mishra and Hema, uh, when the migrants in your case studies uh, do cross borders, um, how does that idea of territoriality come into play? Um, do the obligations of the sending or receiving state uh, travel across these boundaries as well? Um, yeah, perhaps I can invite the uh, panelists to respond in reverse order so we can hear from Hema, um, Priscilla and Emma, followed by Prof. Mishra. Sorry, um, just to rephrase the question, uh, or like to clarify, you're asking is if when migrants move from one territory to another, sending or receiving states, whether the obligations follow? Yes, uh, or how do, um, or how are states, how can we bind states perhaps um, to make good on their obligations, um, even uh, across borders? Um, yeah, so I think um, one key way is that we, we need to recognize that, like, especially in the, re in the region, for example, if they take ASEAN, for example, um, migrants moving from one country, we all depend on each other. And I think right now the problem would be that because the supply, like what we're talking about with capitalism, capitalism the supply of low-wage migrant workers is a lot higher. Um, and because migrants are then seen as replaceable in that sense. So if I lose one migrant here, it doesn't really uh, matter to me that much because I can replace them with another person, right? Um, so in that sense, using the power of the state to kind of push countries, especially from um, sending countries, because it's in their interest to make sure that the well-being of their workers are um, you know, kind of protected in that sense, because we don't want uh, migrant workers, because every time a migrant worker moves into Singapore, for example, they're screened for their health, um, and they're only allowed in if their health is good. But a lot of times when they go back, they might have other health issues like chronic diseases or they're impacted by injury, and that doesn't help the sending countries at all. Um, so I think using that power, uh, state power to push like receiving countries to form bilateral ties and ensure that they're, you know, this they're, they're um, kind of adhere to, I think, um, is possible. And there are many bilateral ties that are present um, within the region itself. Um, and I think just Singapore doesn't, hasn't taken up any yet. Um, so in that sense, it, I think the power lies in like sending countries kind of push for that as well to um, ensure that their economic growth and development is protected. Right, okay. So it sounds like quite a lot of potential there um, for Southeast Asian arrangement. Um, Priscilla and Emma, how about in your context? Yeah, I can start off on that one. Um, and I think I'll start off by saying it's, it's an interesting question sort of at this time in US immigration policy and history because one of the themes that I see in the Trump era uh, immigration policies is this um, pushing of enforcement out of the US. So it's it's moving the point of enforcement of immigration policies, policies outside of our territory, outside of our country. Um, and so I do, I do think it brings up those interesting questions you're raising about how, how the state, you know, geographically um, plays a role or how the state plays a role outside of the country in, um, in those policies. So the MPP isn't the only case in which um, the U.S. is carrying out um, enforcement, I suppose is the right word, outside of our borders. Um, and I would argue, and, and Priscilla can uh, agree or not to this, but I would argue that it's sort of degrading our humanitarian response and, and our status as a, you know, a safe country for migrants um, because of the way that it's um, it's almost throwing our hands up at our at the responsibility to migrants by by putting it on the Mexican government in this case, where the Mexican government is simultaneously saying, "Well, they're not our quote unquote migrants," um, and so I think that that ambiguity around I don't want to say who the migrants belong to, but sort of the ambiguity about the the space that they're occupying and who's responsible for that. Um, means that no one's essentially responsible. And so the the really inhumane um, conditions that you see along the US-Mexico border right now are left to exist without anyone really stepping in. Um, so yeah, I do think it's a really sort of interesting question in this particular moment because of how 
much the US has pushed our immigration policy off of our own um, borders over the last couple of years. Yeah, and I, I kind of just want to add to that a little bit. So I think I definitely second everything that Emma just said, but I, I do think it's important to note that the US and Mexico governments did negotiate on this policy, right? Like they did come to agreement on this policy. And this is done by the Trump administration and by the Mexican president administration, um, Lopez Obrador, right? So they came together and they decided to allow this policy. And originally they allowed these policies, the Mexican government did, where there was infrastructure and where they could like allow it to happen better. So which is why it also started in Tijuana first, right? Like where it's the biggest uh, receiving port of asylum seekers. And so I think that that's really important to note that even though this this was negotiated between them, so there should be some shared responsibility in what happens. And right now the US has not stepped up and provided any aid in that um, for asylum seekers. And just lastly, it also goes into like going into territories and what Emma said of like um, the US kind of imposing and forcing other countries to enforce its immigration policy. I think it's really important to note the power dynamics between that, right? Like Mexico and the United States, the United States threatened, threatened sanctions and threatened all of these, <clears throat> excuse me, tariffs on Mexico, right? And Mexico is so reliant on all of these things that sure it was a negotiation, but is it really a fair negotiation to go into, right? When you have like your hands tied behind your back. So I just think that both of these things are important to know, right? Like both of these governments are definitely at fault for allowing this to go on and for agreeing to it to happen. Right. Um, Prof. Mishra, I, I'm aware that the, the context that you were talking about, many of the migrants were internal migrants, right? Moving within India's borders. But I suppose um, even within India, um, different state governments would have uh, different burdens of responsibility as well. Right. Uh, the first point that I would like to make is that to, is, is, is something uh, which needs to be recognized, although it is said all the all the time, that, that migrant rights must be located, must be embedded in basic human rights. Similarly, the right of migrant workers, it must be seen in the context of worker rights in an economy. So to the extent that there has been a rollback, rolling back of basic uh, worker rights, particularly in India and elsewhere as well, in the contemporary world, it becomes very difficult to, to find, you know, to, to, to make sufficient you know, kind of alliances to push for a very specific migrant rights. Having said that, there, there, there is a tension between two things. One is the universalization of rights, a universal conception of rights, which, which doesn't look at migrant workers differently. The other thing is the very specific conditions of migrant lives, which requires very specific kind of state actions. Even at the level of provincial governments or state governments in India, there are some initiatives which, which, have, which, which different state governments have started to, to take that, for example, there is an agreement between Odisha and the neighboring state Andhra Pradesh. So we are, we, we are beginning to see some kind of a coordination across different state governments, but we are yet to see a framework where the rights are not tied to one's place of origin. Once that is, I mean, which is, no, which should not be uh, a big deal as such. Of course, there is a federal government, there are layers of governments and there, there are lots of negotiations to be done. Right? Why exactly, as, 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 as uh, it has already been pointed out by my co-panelist, there is always a line separating us and them. So the, so the point is to, to push for a, a, a set of universal rights which are non, non-negotiable within or beyond borders. At the same time, looking at specific forms of vulnerability, which requires very specific forms of intervention at multiple levels. I think I'll stop here. Yeah. Um... I, I just wanted to open the floor as well in case um, anyone has questions uh, for your fellow panelists uh, responding to the other presentations. Um, yeah, please, please feel free. We do have a few more minutes. Shall I start? I can. Oh, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so one thing, one common thing which I saw in, in all these, uh, all our presentations is, of course, the question of identity. Uh, despite you know, all these uh, emphasis on universal rights and, and human rights, the identity of the migrant is something which is a key determinant of, of, of the kinds of rights which over he or she is going to get on the ground. So, so what, are the, what, is our, what is our thoughts about uh, recognition of these identities? So, I mean, if you, if you emphasize too much on the identities of the migrants, then, then, then there is a danger of undermining the, the universal rights of citizens as such. So to what extent 
uh, those who who are you know argue for uh, migrant rights to what extent should they should they bring in the question of identity to the forefront of our, of, of our arguments at least Anyone? I can go ahead, Hima, if you don't mind, uh, to go and take a stab at it. Um, I, I, I think I'm understanding your question correctly. So like, what does it mean to identify as migrant and like, how does that maybe take away from their, how does that like dehumanize them potentially, right? And so I do think that that's really important. And that's an, a mindful thing that Emma and I and our co-researchers, at uh, Jessica and Juani, tried to really mention and bring up. In our case, these weren't just migrants. They were asylum seekers, right? And so it was really important to, human, like, to humanize them and to humanize their experiences and to really put them into context. Um, so that's why in our report, in our, in our paper, we made the conscious effort and decision to call them as consistently call them asylum seekers, right? Because I think there's just different connotations when you refer to a migrant and when you refer to an asylum seeker, right? Um, for better, for worse, that's the reality that we live in. And so I, I don't know, I, Emma may want to add more to this, but I, I do think that that's really important to humanize them and to maybe add more layers to the quote unquote migrant, right? Like how do we humanize them? How do we, how are we able to connect with them as as other individuals that maybe don't have their shared experiences. Yeah, I was just going to, um, I think like Priscilla brought up the point uh, of humanizing them. Um, I think that like, for example, for economic migrants, a lot of times when you think about like economic migrants, like people think, oh, they're taking away our jobs or like, you know, that's that perspective as well. But like, if you're looking at like low wage migrant workers, they're not taking away their job, uh, anyone's jobs there, they're literally replacing or filling the gap in which like the population doesn't want to work in um, and and so that kind of like brings all of this like different connotations um, when we kind of label them and I think the process of kind of humanizing them and and showing that like they are coming in to kind of help the country as well um, and also help themselves and help the country um, their families back home so like humanizing that whole process might be the pro uh, way to go um, in in you know kind of kind of debunking all of the connotations that come along with um, the, the idea of a migrant. Um, and I, but then I would also argue that we kind of need that, um, that label because they come with so many, like as I mentioned, there are so many different factors that affect say their well-being, which are very different from say um, the population in which they're going into. So I guess I, I, I think I'm struggling between like completely removing that label but also keeping it at the same time because you need that nuance and to understand that there are so many different factors affecting their well-being, for example. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think Priscilla had something to raise as well. Oh, I think I said that, but did my audio cut off? I can repeat it. Oh, uh, no, no. I mean, um, before, uh, to, to ask the other panelists. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so... Uh, as a gender studies scholar as well, this is something that I always look for in, in my research and in papers that I'm like reading and stuff like that. So I'm just curious to see what um, Prof. Mish, uh, Mish, uh, oh, Mishra, sorry, and what Hema's like um, engagement was with that. Like, how did you see the gendered component interacting with that? And did they have, because of the gendered component, were there different priorities for different migrants um, that you saw of like that they wish that they could maybe prioritize or were there different social groups and social actors involved in the specific communities that you were, were in or looking at that provided um, specific relief for different like gendered groups or anything like that? Um, I'm just kind of curious of like how you guys saw that play out in your research. Can I go ahead? Yeah. So uh, in, in, in my research, gender is, is something uh, which is at least which can be seen as a key constitutive element of, of this migration process at multiple levels. The first distinction is that one kind of migration where the family migrates, which is not, not the, the all India story, very specific to the region that I'm talking about. If it is a family migration, often you find that it is the head of the household, the male head of the household who is negotiating on behalf of the migrant worker. So even in that setup, you don't, the migrant worker simply doesn't have any agency to bargain. So somebody is bargaining 
on behalf of her. So that is one set of story. But that is not the entire story. You also see very segmented, segregated markets, labor markets, which typically target uh, women from indigenous communities. And you see the contrast. That's what I, I raised the question of identities. Economists don't believe identity to be a key constitutive elements of markets. They, they seem to think that markets work on the, on the on, on some impersonal rules. But then why do you see such concentration of women workers, say, as, as domestic caregivers in, 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 in cities of India? So there is a very specific segregated migration flow. Having said that, there are other kinds of flows where, where the, distinctive, the, the, the line of distinction is not very clear. For example, uh, there are exploitative streams where, where migrant workers are not paid enough, not, not, paid, not given a due. But at the same time, such migration, despite having uh, the negative economic consequences also free women from some sort of they give give gives give women some agency to find uh, their voice to find find a, a place uh, for themselves. So initially, even if the the migration starts with a very exploitative kind of experience, over the period of time, you find that women finally, uh, you know, trying to make best of a very difficult situation. So, so all these things. There is a third. There is another category of migrants who who are not recognized as workers, who migrate to the cities with their families, and they, 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 their primary role is, is is in the reproductive uh, repro, reproductive care sphere rather than you know in the productive sector of the economy. But overall, if you analyze them from a macro perspective, what they are doing, all of them are doing, is simply subsidizing the cost of labor for capital. I mean, you may not agree with that, but the ultimate, you know, the the, the ultimate uh, objective of having all this is is providing labor at the cheapest possible rate. So even if somebody is a quote unquote housewife, simply working inside the home, is is actually uh, is is playing a very vital role in this process of globally integrated capitalist accumulation. Uh, this is the, the you cannot have such cheap labor without having the unpaid domestic workers. So all these different categories of when workers are linked to the process of migration. Yeah, I think going off what Prof. Mr. has said, um, especially just going off like the domestic work realm, I think um, the work is gendered in that sense. So female migrant workers are employed only to do domestic work in the country, um, not say in construction work, for example. And in that realm, for um, the work that they do within the home then brings in a lot of other constraints. So for example, there is no like line between this is work and this is um, my space at home. Um, and, and the concept of home itself then comes up as a question because what is home if you're working in the realm of the home in a foreign country? Um, so um, female domestic workers kind of face that um, kind of dilemma as well. Uh, yeah, so I think in that sense, it's very gendered. Um, and because in the space and the, the place that they work in is uh, very different, it brings up like very different experiences as well for um, both male and female migrant workers. Great. Okay, thank you um, all for the questions and responses. Uh, unfortunately, we will have to cut short the Q&A here, although I'm sure that we could go on discussing these ideas for much longer. Um, I want to especially thank uh, Emma and Priscilla for waking up early in the morning in Texas to join us for this session, um, but also to extend very warm uh, thanks uh, to both Prof Mishra and Hema uh, for being part of this panel as well. Um, this, as I said, is the first uh, session of the academic component of this year's Global Migrant Festival. And to those of um, you who are tuning in, uh, there will be two further uh, sessions. Um, the next one will be titled In Their Voices, and it will focus on foregrounding migrants' narratives, meanings, and experiences. Um, the third one uh, will be um, a live discussion uh, with three guests, three very special guests here in Singapore. Um, and they will try to tie some of the ideas that we have been talking about in the first two sessions um, back to the Singaporean context. Um, so do stay tuned. More details will be on the Global Migrant Festival's uh, Facebook and Instagram pages. And um, please join me at this point um, in thanking our panelists once again. So um, together with my colleagues here at the Global Migrant Festival, Shivaji and Carissa, um, thanks very much to Prof Mishra, Hema, Priscilla and Emma for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.